I, for a number of years, I've been doing a dance with uh, global climate change, global warming in particular, looking at worldwide data collected from the 1700s forward, trying to understand what the truth is from a data-driven perspective, not from a political perspective. So <clears throat> my blog's called datablends.us, and if you come over to the blog and you look at the series, Climate Change Quantified, this explains the history of what I've been doing and why. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of work that I've done. This work has been a, a work in progress for about for about eight years. Um, the motivation for it happens to be this little guy here, Jed, who's now 10 years old at the time here. He was much younger, but uh, when I began the work, <clears throat> and so this is the really the beginning of the work, the story behind it of why I've even involved in it, and then I've been involved in multiple phases of it. Phase one, my initial work with it, phase two, phase three, and now I'm in phase four, and I've done a huge amount of work lately on understanding um, so how some of my perspectives that I developed for from the first three phases, how they look in a more statistically rigorous format. Um, spending time on getting a new a new data set, the latest data set through July of 2021, reprocessing all of that, applying um, p-values to the linear models that I create. Um, so I'm going to show an animation coming up here of the latest results. Um, not only am I looking at the statistical rigor of the models, I'm looking at the assumption of the baseline assumption that I chose uh, back in the beginning of this was starting from 1960 forward, um, looking at the temperature change over the last 60 plus years. But this time I looked at the baseline conditions from 1960 to 2021, 1970 to 2021, and 1980 to 2021 to understand how important is the initial condition. So if you're interested in re reading some of the work that I've done, here it is. And <clears throat> we're going to look at uh, this dashboard, and I'm going to animate this over time. But to understand the context of what we're talking about here is you can imagine that uh, we've got the sun, we've got the earth. Earth goes around the sun every year. So for on January 1st, we're a certain distance away from the sun. We go around it. 365 days later, we're back in the same position. Um, so my perspective that developed over those the past eight years of this is I could look at change um, at a monitoring station on Earth, any one of these dots shown here. I can pick a dot. I could say, on January 1st, what has the data looked like over the last 60 years for that monitoring station? And so by doing that, I generate linear, I can generate models of predictable models of how is the temperature changing over that time period. And in this case, I'm just using linear models, simple framework, because I'm having to compute millions of models. Um, as, as, time, as you go further back in time, you have fewer monitoring stations. And in 1960 to now, there's maybe 4,000 monitoring stations that have a continuous record across the world. So um, by the time you get to 1980, you have more monitoring stations. So let's take a look at what, what does this mean. So we, we basically, we stick at a monitoring station. Uh, this is the day of January 1st. All of the points shown here are points that are statistically significant. What I mean by that is the p-value is less than 0 0.05. In other words, we're 95% confident that that uh, this is not just random chance, that, that that actually the pattern that we see in the data is real. We're rejecting the null hypothesis that this is just random noise. And when we do this, we can see that we get clustering of heating zones, the red dots, clustering of cooling zones in blue. And um, if we, well, so let's take a look at the breakdown of the dashboard first. So we have, in this case, 65 statistically significant monitoring stations on the day of January 1st, crossing the time frame from 1960 to 2021. And this is for Canada, Mexico, and the US. So this is just a North America perspective. Three of those have shown cooling, these three, and that's only 4.6% of the 65. The average change there has been 12 degrees. Um, on, the, on the opposite side, on the heating side, 62 of those have shown heating, 95% of them. 
at 9.3 degrees of heating in the zones, the kind of these two heating zones, the west coast and kind of the, towards the northeast. This is the histogram of the, the changes for these. So this particular one in Ohio has seen 11 degree change. If we were to show all the data and we just come over here and just say, yes, show me all the data. <clears throat> this is, these are the kinds of patterns I had been investigating. I've been looking at these and wondering, okay, so we have the big heating zone, we have a cooling zone and a heating zone. What parts of these are statistically significant? Is this just all in the noise or is some of the stuff real? That's really the question I wanted to answer because it looks like all of Alaska heats up and the Midwest is cooled down on this day. And as I put this animation into motion, if I just take uh, go one more day to January 2nd, that's what it looks like. January 3rd looks like that. Each day has a different pattern. But I'm not interested in looking at those patterns anymore. I want to know the statistical significance. So we're going to go back to just looking at statistical significance. And, it, and I'm going to animate this. So we're going to see the development of these zones. And remember now, in this case, as, as this runs, as I put this into motion, you're going to see how these patterns change from, from day to day. And in a lot of cases, it looks like, in a way, it's a, like a weather pattern moving across the country. Like right there is a good example. A big heating zone that takes many days to cross the country. And it turns out that that particular heating zone, uh, there's, there's a reason for it. Um, I won't talk about the reason right now. I might put it into the article. But when you begin to see this type of thing, when you begin to understand that if big jet stream changes are happening over time in allowing either cold air to come down into the country or, or not, and you get more heating, those changes are large scale. And you would expect that they would last over a day, that they would expect, I would expect that the shifting of the jet stream could be um, very significant and profound. And so you could see the development of big heating and cooling zones. Now, many days we don't really see much here. You could, as you could see, like right there is a pretty good heating and cooling zone, but some days there's not much action at all. So it just depends upon the time of the year and what the, how the jet stream has been perturbed or the other causes of this, which are human induced causes. So we can just basically look at this and say, okay, what days of the year do we really see a significant impact? Some days, not so much like these days here, you know, there's not really a huge impact, but other days there are. And it's very interesting. And I would like to understand why, why is it that certain times of the year, there's more cooling. I think in April here, we might start seeing some cooling. There we go. <clears throat> Mid-country mid cooling. Now, this is from the baseline condition of 1960 to 19 or to 2021. We're going to have the same type of animation starting in 1970 to 2021, and also 1980 to 2021. So it's up to me to to create these animations, and then uh, take basically screenshots of the same day to take a look what changes have happened, and so. Um, that's kind of the whole point of this phase four of the work is to understand with more statistical rigor what's in the noise, what's real, or you know likely to be real when we see these big, huge <clears throat> red heating zones covering large areas of the country. There's something causing that. That's just not random noise. There's a clear and distinct separation between cooling and heating zones. So here we are almost halfway through the year. Um, pretty big heating zone there in the middle of June. Um, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take me a, a lot of work to begin to understand what has caused this. Maybe I'll never be able to comprehend it or, or unravel it. So, there's some things I've already figured out, but um, the variation here from day to day is uh is is due to the earth going around the sun being different distances from the sun it's also has to do with changes of the jet stream it has to do with human impact uh, human activities so it'll be um, very interesting to try to unravel some of this and really to, just to quantify what what days can we say are 
going to be warmer than expected or cooler than expected. Um, I think to me that's been maybe the main driver here is I've, I've, I've wanted to understand one of the perspectives I want to understand is that global warming is not just about heating. It's also about cooling. It's about change. And it's not all about heating. There can be some cool cool zones developing in the summer in the central U.S., for example. That was a very unexpected finding. Um, but I also want to understand, is there any predictability to what appears to be an unpredictable situation? Can we strip away some of the complexity by changing our perspective here instead of looking at data um, in a, a normal time series format for this year compared to last year by changing it and switching it out to I'm at a monitoring station at this day and I'm going to look at each data point is one year so one year goes by here's another data point another data point and we know that we're going to get a lot of variation but is that is that a, an, a, um, an acceptable framework for look, look at the cooling zones developed there in the upper Midwest, very profound in October. And again, this is from the 1960 to 2021 perspective. As we go to the 1970 perspective and the 1980 baseline perspective, we pick up additional monitoring wells, uh, monitoring wells, uh, monitoring stations, going back to my groundwater days there with monitoring wells. But when you have more data then, um, you have the likelihood of picking up even better definition of the patterns that are emerging here, the statistically significant patterns. So labor of love, uh, big shout out to James Dunkerley, my friend, uh, Altrix genius, who wrote um, a macro-based regression package for uses of cases like this where I'm computing millions of linear models. I extended that package recently by uh, allowing the computation of p-values. These p-values computations um, are what allowed me to do what we're doing here where we're visualizing only statistically significant results. So thank you James for that and um, just to put it in perspective. The, the Using the R package that comes with Alteryx. It took to do one day computation. For one day, all the monitoring stations took 26 hours. And then I was able to write a code to uh, break down the report coming from R and extract the p-values. That So 26 hours to do the run, another workflow to extract the p-values, and uh, that's 26 hours. To do it with James James's linear re regression package combined with my p-value package um, or my p-value calculator, I was able to do one entire year. This animation we just looked at took um, about 40 minutes compared to 26 hours for one day. So to do an entire year with the R-based package would have taken, I think I estimated uh, um, over 26 days of computation compared to 40 minutes. So Again, Alteryx is awesome, James Dunkerley is awesome, and it's uh, really helped me take the next step of this research. So thank you for listening.